one of the biggest decisions I ever had to make with my husband was over a couple of beers in a local pizza joint. Yep, we decided to get off the pill over beer. Oh. <laughs> my husband claimed it could be fun. <laughs> fun? Changing poopy diapers, having sleepless nights, staining every single shirt with spit up, and saying, don't touch that, put that down, or spit out dad's potting soil, or if we were to have a boy, stop playing with your penis in public. <laughs> but I got to thinking, we live on this beautiful Iowa Midwestern family farm full of hundreds of acres of green space cattle and trees. So I relented. I thought, yeah, sharing nature with the child could be fun. But I was afraid I'd be that kind of mom, the kind of mom whose child may throw a colossal fit in the middle of an aisle at Walmart, or the kind of mom whose child sobs throughout the entire flight of an airplane, disturbing everybody's quiet, or the kind of mom who helicopter parents and talks about her child constantly, all the while donning a sweatshirt that says, I'm the proud parent of an honor student. <laughs> Not this gal. But two months later, I'm pregnant. It's March of 2009, and my husband and I find ourselves coming home from our birthing class, proudly carrying our birthing plan, and we make ourselves to the farm and find our way into the cattle lot. Our first heifer of the season is giving birth to her calf, so my husband John says, you know, you, you need to stay and watch. <laughs> so with the last push, the calf gives birth to a motionless child, a stillborn. And we're sad about this because that happens, and nature happens this way, and we know that this could happen to us. All night long, we hear the mama calf alone, ball in the feedlot. But the next morning, the sun comes up, and the mama cow walks up to the bunk and starts to eat her breakfast. It's really amazing. It's like she just got on with living. I mean, cows are not known for their smart, <laughs> intelligent, long-term memories, but she just grieved overnight and, and seemed to move forward. We find ourselves, just weeks later, making an unexpected trip to the hospital. And we're silent in the car. We notice that spring is all around the budding of the magnolia trees and the green blossoms of, of different plants <coughs> popping and even the barren fields are coming alive with cows and calves kicking up their heels in pasture. We walk into the hospital room and I remember feeling this wave of every hospital smells and feels the same way, you know, that, that, that starch <laughs> stiff smell. And we make ourselves into, we get into the, the, the hospital room, and the nurse lies me down on the bed very stiffly. And I'm lying there, and I'm thinking, you know, how long is this going to take? I just want to check on my daughter, Shirley May, and, and make sure that she's all right. I mean, just a couple days prior, nine months pregnant, my OBGYN says, you know, any day now, any day now. Well, a nurse comes in and she's got this warm smile and, and immediately is comforting me and says, you know, we need to check your heartbeat and your daughter's heartbeat. And so she, with the stethoscope, is checking my heartbeat and then slowly, ever so slowly, circling around my belly. And her smile begins to stiffen. And I think nothing of it for the moment, but I know something's going on here. And she says, you know, let me get another nurse and another stethoscope. Something must be wrong with this one. So another nurse comes into the space, and the same motion happens all over again, the very same where stethoscope put on my belly, slow, gentle circle. And this time, though, the second nurse, I'm noticing her arm is shaking. And I'm thinking my husband grips my hand just a little bit harder because we know something is dreadfully wrong. So she says we're going to bring in a third nurse and a doctor. 
so in walks that we had two nurses and a third come in and, and and the doctor too and I just remember the fact that they turned the monitor away from my husband and me and didn't have it face us was really we were aware of that and all I can remember is as that wand was going over my belly the doctor in a very low tone said I'm, I'm sorry I'm, I'm, I'm just so sorry my daughter, Shirley May, named after my beloved grandmother, her heartbeat had stopped. Just stopped. So I started to ask myself, now when exactly could this heartbeat have stopped? Was it just the day prior when I happened to be, it was Easter Sunday, and, and, and I was flooded with lots of friends and family, and they were all so excited congratulating me that it's going to be any moment. Or was it when I was sitting in the church pew, hear, hearing the hymns drone on and on, but I noticed some sort of like undetectable change in the movement or behavior. Or was it just earlier that day when I gave a call to a really, really good friend of mine who had just had a baby and all she said was, Tina, it's no big deal. Your baby's stuffed in there, so stuffed in there that you can't feel the movement. Lying in that bed with my husband at my side, I started to flood through all the different comments and conversations we'd had with one another and it was really interesting that just a few weeks prior, my husband said at a baby shower, do, we, do you think we're putting the cart before the horse? And even I said just at a walk a day before, wouldn't it be a shame to lose this child we've fallen in love with? Mm -hmm. Even that day, before he made that unexpected trip to the hospital, I found this intense urgency to put together my daughter's baby book. Somehow, we both knew this was going to happen, but yet we didn't verbalize it to one another. And although this was the most devastating news that we'd ever had in our entire lives, it wasn't crippling, because somehow nature had prepared us. A few weeks later, I found myself being just numb, you know, through the whole process. And unlike that cow who just seemed to grieve overnight. I cried and I cried and I couldn't even peel, I didn't even have the energy to peel out the, the diaper bag from the back seat of the car for weeks because I was sad for what it symbolized. Just three weeks later, I found myself in what would have been my daughter's bedroom. It was perfect. It had a floral mobile and I opened the bedroom window and, and this light spring breeze is coming through and the waft of the beautiful sweet scent of the magnolia trees are coming in. And the, I see all these G diapers and toys and books and a perfectly made crib. It was perfect. And it was in that moment for the very first time I found this warm comfort in silence, in the silence and calmness of nature. You know, that's the thing about, I felt losing a child, y you just, you don't move on, you move forward. You know that there's gonna be another day, another sunrise, another sunset, you know, because nature, nature waits for no one. You know, we, we had a lot of support from people in fact, though, a lot of people didn't know exactly how to handle it, you know, with a child, lose, loss of a child. In fact, I remember opening a card that my husband and I would look at every single day. It was for my great aunt, and it said, so sorry for your loss, exclamation point. How are things otherwise, question mark. Better luck next time, exclamation point. And we laughed. It was helpful in some ways, but you know, but the whole, but because pe people just don't know what to say, they're crippled, they want the answer, why? Why? But nature, nature doesn't need a reason, doesn't need an answer. There's no truth with a capital T. Oftentimes, we go in conversation, we ask people, you know, how many children do you have? And that's, that's a really difficult question for me to answer. Do I say one? And I found myself in a conversation with this where you get the interviewer asking more follow-up questions and you're getting more and more uncomfortable. Now, do, do you continue this conversation or do you say none? And it feels like a lie. For the longest time I said one, even though my child wasn't in my arms. 
I said one because I just I was, I was fearing that she would be forgotten. Later that summer, we're pregnant again with a son. And his due date is the exact same due date as his older sister's. We're happy, but cautiously happy, for this pregnancy is completely different. We take months to even celebrate or go and get anything remotely baby. And we don't tell family until it's obvious that my belly is starting to swell. But when my stomach stopped growing, the exact day it did is his older sister, Shirley, we, I started seeing specialists two to three times a week, hooked up to a machine, counting kicks. And when I wasn't at a doctor's office for hours, I had to keep a kick counting journal and note down the kicks 30 minutes at a time, three or four times a day. The doctors showed this worry, you know, this calm worry, but because they wanted a different result. They, they put, I felt this pressure, you know, am I eating enough? Am I doing things just right? Um, because humans want to control everything, it feels like. We, we even want the exact time of when we deliver the child, but nature, nature waits for no one. And there is no reason sometimes. Even this year, our magnolia tree just frost overnight. All that years waiting, waiting for that beauty was just whoop, gone in a moment. The direct parallels of my son and my daughter just really surprised my husband and me. You know, we, we had a specialist. He gave us the biggest hope. He said, you know, you're healthy. You're really healthy, and I think, I think this boy is going to come out on his own. Just a day after that, my husband called elated on the phone. He said, Tina, guess what? Our first heifer had a baby early, and it's getting up. It's a little weak, but it's getting up, and it's sucking for mama. I think we're going to have this boy early. Two days later, five and a half weeks early, we give birth to our son. You know, I heard once that when you lose a parent, you become an orphan. And when you lose a spouse, you become a widow. But when you lose a child, there are no words. It's just too painful. The loss of Shirley was very, the pain of that was very deep. But it was the sounds and sights of nature that helped me move forward, not move on. Now I find myself in the grocery store being okay with those annoying screams of child <laughs> here and there. And yet even in a plane, I just don't get annoyed with, with the sobs and the cries of babies because I remember my summer of silence. Even seven years later, I, my Shirley May is still with me for that 40-year-old magnolia tree that is now greeting my son outside her bedroom window. It blossoms. Ever since her death, it re-blossoms multiple times, not only in the summer, but in the fall, in my most trying times. And even though our magnolia tree frosted prematurely, I know it's going to re-blossom someday. I'm okay and I'm at peace with that because nature just is. And if we take the time to listen to her, she will continue to speak.